Hi and welcome everyone uh, to uh, Ravenscroft Reviews Conversations about CVI. I'm Professor John Ravenscroft and today it really gives me a fantastic pleasure and an honour to introduce uh, Professor Amanda Lewick. Hello Amanda. Hey John. So for what people don't know is there have been really about two mentors in my life with, regarding CVI. Professor Gordon Dutton as you all probably know, and the other one is Amanda. And every time I get a question, every time I'm stuck, every time I need to think about something, I ask Amanda. So it's, it really is a great privilege to speak to you today. And thanks for coming, Amanda. So, so how are you? I am quite good. Thank you for asking and thank you for having me in this set of um, uh, questioning. I appreciate it. Well, it's, it, it, I think the honor is all mine. Okay, so what we're going to start with, uh, Amanda, is um, which I actually don't really know, is uh, a little bit of a step back, if you don't mind. So, um, who are you, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and why? What got you? Um, I'm asking everyone this, really. And what really got you interested in CVI? You know, rather than just staying with it, uh, with being a typical TVI. What what really got you interested in CVI? I'm actually interested in that because I just don't know. Okay, well, I can't really tell you who I am. Um, that's something that I'm still discovering. Um, but um, I can tell you how I became interested in CBI. And it was um, many years ago, I was working at the university at UC Berkeley, and I decided I wanted to go back to work with children. So I um, accepted a position at um, in a school district and became an itinerant teacher, which I loved, and it put me back into the reality of what was happening, you know, in the in the schools and what I could do to help children and teachers. And on my caseload, I had about six or seven children who were diagnosed with CBI, and each one of them was very very different. And with some, I was very successful in implementing interventions. And with others, it, it just floored me as to what to do to help those children. I tried different things. They had different causes of their CVI. Um, one child just flourished beautifully with the interventions I was giving. Others, I just kept trying and trying and trying. So um, circumstances changed. I um, took a position at San Francisco State and was able to start um, doing more thought work on CBI and doing some research on CBI. And I, I realized that it's, it was more than one phenomenon. And I think even now on CBI Scotland, they call it cerebral visual impairments rather than cerebral visual impairment. And so I started trying to understand why the children responded differently with the same diagnosis. And it's been a quest that um, I've been pursuing for the last 20 years, um, trying to come up with ways to understand the children, um, assess them, and um, apply interventions that are effective. And, and it's that um, assessment that I'm really interested in. I think when I get, uh, I will see a child, see a family, and, and, I, I, and I'm stuck, I always, it's, it's about assessment that I email you about, Amanda. I say, hey, Amanda, I've got this child, what do, what do, what do I do now? So, so, so I'm really interested in, 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 in your ideas about assessment. And, and, and what I'm particularly interested in, and I know you've written a lot about this, is this holistic idea. So do you want to, do you want to help me out more about this holistic view of assessment? Well, Children are complicated, and children with CBI are extremely complicated. And it's really important to understand all the potential manifestations of CBI in order to see which ones apply to each child. 
um, as I go back to the first children that I worked with intensely, I see that some of these manifestations were present in some children and not others. And there are some organic reasons for that that have come out a lot thanks to people in Europe like Gordon Dutton, Leah Havarnan, um, Lena Jakobsen, um, so many of them. And now there's being worked on in um, the US with Barry Cram, Latfi, Maribet, Karina Bauer. So more and more stuff is coming out. But we need to understand how all these pieces of the puzzle of children with CVI fit together. And one of the things that's really important to understand is that it's very important to look at um, the visual functions of children with CVI to understand what their acuity is, what their visual fields are, what their contrast sensitivity is, because these can be affected in children with CVI, even in children with no ocular impairment. Children with CVI can have problems with these uh, quote unquote visual functions in addition to the visual processing stuff. So when we first looked at children with CVI, we talked about having this holistic assessment of looking at um, these visual functions, looking at dorsal stream issues, ventral stream issues, um, a la Gordon, um, and also all kinds of visual processing issues that Dr. Havarnan has brought out as um, something we need to look at. We need to look at accommodation. Um, if we don't understand these basic things, we can't understand how these things affect visual processing. If a child can't, go ahead, John. Yeah, well, I was just gonna say, I mean, do you think that um, sometimes we, we jump in too much and just only think about, you know, the brain as it were, uh, 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 and, and CVI within the brain without checking these visual functions first. You know, I mean, I've gone into schools and done a little bit of training and going, okay, show me the child's, um, uh, you know, acuity scores, field scores, and they look at me and go, well, why would you want to know that? You know, <laughs> and so, exactly. yeah, yeah. So, so does, that, does that occur that people jump in, you think? Um, it's really clear that that's happening. Um, a lot of times when I'm given reports, I don't even see an acuity score. I don't see if they've got a refractive error or an accommodative insufficiency. So say you report that the child can't pick someone out from a crowd. Well, it could be that they have issues with simultaneagnosia and the inability to see more than one or two things at a time. But it could also be that they have low acuity and they can't see that far. And it could be something as simple as that. And, it, you know, Dr. Hervarnan shows a really beautiful video of a child getting glasses on a, a young baby for accommodation insufficiency. And all of a sudden, the child can see faces at near. Yeah. And um, it, it was never checked because this kind of thing is not a typical issue for young children. But it is something that needs to be checked for children with CVI. So it's just simple things like that that are not that simple that can explain a lot of behavioral consequences. And it could be that these things are not the only thing that are in operation. They could have myopia and have problems with visual complexity but it would be good to know in order to determine the appropriate interventions. Yeah, absolutely. And this is why we also need to train up our uh, pediatric ophthalmologists, our orthoptists, our optometrists, uh, so that we can get this baseline measure, so we can understand you know, exactly in terms of that visual behavior, visual process, visual behaviors, what the child is actually, the acuity is seeing within that, you know, not, not the processing part, but with, within that baseline measure. And so, 
I'm so glad to uh, uh, to hear this from you because it's something that um, we just seem to miss. And like I say, when we go into schools and do the training, it's like, well, where is this data? Why have you not Why have you not done this? And there are a whole range of measures to do this. But but tell me more about who who else should be involved in this multidisciplinary assessment. Well, because there are multiple consequences of CBI that might be in operation. Um, you need to have um, eye care practitioners, um, depending upon the region. It would be optometrists, ophthalmologists, orthoptists. Um, we need to have the medical doctors involved in terms of understanding the cause of the condition, and that could be um, the general practitioners or the neuro neurologists or anyone who would have that capability of making that diagnosis of CVI. Um, um, and that could also be the, the eye care practitioners. Um, we need to have um, orientation and mobility instructors involved, teachers of the visually impaired, um, speech language pathologists because there can be auditory consequences of CBI. It's just coming out now and I think they just posted something on CBI Scotland and also something from California Deaf Blind Services of um, auditory processing disorders, cerebral auditory processing disorders that are in parallel to visual processing disorders and CV cerebral visual impairments. Yeah, um, and I, I think I, I mentioned on another talk, I can't remember, um, but it's along the lines of, okay, so you, 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 well done, you've got these baseline measures and well done, you've got your understanding and you've done some assessment on uh, uh, the ventral and dorsal or processing areas, but, but then you're assuming that the child can hear, <laughs> that, that the child can process everything and there's, there's not even a baseline on that as well. And so... And so when I, you know, and it, th we need this data. We do need this data. And I think that, um, you know, it's a little frustrating right now because um, understanding CBI is a new field. And we're all scrambling to try to understand what's going on. And the pieces of the puzzle are coming together and um, they're coming together from different fields. And that's why bringing the fields together for a holistic understanding and multidisciplinary assessments right now is particularly important. You know, I look at it from the standpoint of a, a teacher of the visually impaired, which is my background. Someone else would look at it from the uh, standpoint of a psychologist. Someone else would look at it from the standpoint of a medical practitioner. Each one of those, and, or a speech language pathologist, each one of those, or, or an orientation and mobility professional, each one of those perspectives is valid. Oh, 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 absolutely. And you've got to bring that all in. And, you know, and I think in conjunction with the parent, exactly is, is is you know what i'm going to say something quite uh, 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 radical here i think it's the tvi that brings that in you know what i mean i think it's the educator the the the, the qtvi that gets this gets these reports with the parents and, and and sort of like summarizes it and brings it all together that's that's why i think the role of the qtvi is hugely important in supporting families and children with cvi because I think it's them, their role that has that central understanding of all these areas. I really, really do agree with you because um, they have to pull it together. Um, I think that one way that I look at this is that um, the TBIs and the parents and the caregivers know the children better, the parents more than any anybody else, of course. And they're the ones that can talk about the child's behaviors in different circumstances. And because we don't have assessments to 
look at all these behaviors and bring them all together in a, you know, in a universal way, we have to rely on the keen observation skills of the people who work most closely with the child. Now, in some instances, it's not the TBI. In some instances, if the child has normal or near normal acuity, the TBI may not have had much contact. Good point, good point. With, with the child. But we have to do good observations, good history taking in order, and also um, get the viewpoint of the child in all of this. Um, I've learned so much from the older children I've worked with who have CBI who can tell me what they see and what they want and what they need and what they like and what they don't like and what they fear and what they don't fear. Um, so starting with the behaviors is a, is a good way to go and we've worked with that in something I'll be talking about later, I hope, um, a new um, program that we're coming out with um, for the American Printing House for the Blind, myself and Dr. Deborah Chen and Dr. Elizabeth Hartman. And we start out by looking at the behaviors in what we call a CBI profile. But if you just identify the behaviors without looking at the cause the organic root cause of these behaviors you might not apply the appropriate interventions hang on, hang on. let me let me think about that again <laughs> say it again amanda just just so we're clear okay you have the behaviors here i don't have a slide for this but you have <laughs> the behaviors here and you have the root cause here well, say we talk about picking out the person from the group. If the root cause is reduced acuity, you're going to use a different type of intervention than if the root cause is simultanagnosia. If the root cause is visual acuity, you're going to bring the people closer or have the child move closer to the group. If the root cause is simultanagnosia, then the person need, they need to separate so that the elements are more separate, um, have the person who needs to be identified have some kind of identifying clothing on them. That also helps with reduced acuity, but with reduced acuity, you don't need the space. And so you want to apply the right intervention and to know the right of the intervention for the behavior, you need to know the root cause of the behavior. And that's another thing that's been missing, is not going back once you have identified the behaviors and going to the root cause of those behaviors and then making some uh, suggestions for interventions. Yeah, I Does wonder, that make sense? it makes a lot of sense now. I, so th thanks for the clarity. I, I wonder if we've been missing um, you know, several steps there. We're not been getting those baseline behaviors. We might be uh, just looking at the um, uh, 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 the behaviors itself and doing interventions and not tracing our way back, not doing that work, getting ourselves back to that root cause. And so I think, so how do we do that, I suppose? And I guess one thing I'm going to ask you about is, um, about developmental uh, 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 development and 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 you've you've got something that is, is coming on stream and I've read about and we've had conversations a little bit about and, and this is that CVI profile Amanda you just mentioned a little bit so um, can you can you tell me what that is what is yeah, CVI can, profile? I, can I steal the screen for a minute you can you can okay, let, me, let me put up my uh my slide because that I can't, uh, I can't show you with my fingers. <laughs> okay, you got that, John? I got that, I've got it nice and clear. There we go, and I've got you on the right-hand side as well. Brilliant. Okay, so what we've come up with uh, in what we're calling the CVI Companion Guide, 
is uh, our CDI profile categories. And these are different manifestations, possible manifestations of CDI. And you're not going to find all of them in all the children. And um, while the companion guide is for young children um, to age two or maybe three, and potentially for multiply impaired children, um, these CVI profile categories also apply up through adults. Now, I want to stress that you're going to see being developed because this is kind of an idea whose time has come, probably. And when an idea is time has come, different groups will come up with um, different perspectives on the same thing. If you see other profile categories, um, I wouldn't reject them, I would embrace them and look at things that are in some profile categories and not others because they may all have valid points. But in um, the CVI profile categories that we came up with based upon a review of the research that we had at the time, um, we've come up with 16 categories. And um, in these 16 categories, we've broken them down to over 50 subcategories. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. So the manifestations of CVI are multiple. And you have to be on the lookout for them. And um, if you can find them, it can explain so many things about the children. So I'm not going to go into detail of these categories, but I, I made a large slide of it. So if people um, have access to um, this video, they can take a little screenshot of it. And thank you, APH, for allowing us to share this at this time. We're trying yeah. to get the information out as soon as possible. But you'll see that it's the clarity of vision is looking at um, basic visual functions. So is area of vision, um, following people or objects, um, locating people, response to faces, recognition of objects or symbols response to movement, accuracy of visual motor planning and control, imitation of copy and copying color, depth perception, illumination, response to sounds, response to environment, the effects of visual novelty and response time. And these can be all over the map. For example, the effect of visual novelty. Well, some children, um, if they are um, if they uh, are liking visual novelty, um, you've got to provide it. But for some children, um, if you continue to bring the same stimulus in over and over, for example, if a child has blind sight, they habituate to the stimulus. And you have to change the stimulus in order to kick in the use of vision and the child's interest and motivation in what's going on. And some children in novel situations shut down. So um, we've got all these things broken down in the CBI profile categories. And um, the determining a CVI profile, you have to look at the potential manifestations of CVI. Okay, and so so you're going to tell so um, potential manifestations. Okay, so uh, just 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 what does that mean? <laughs> so the potential manifestations were those over fifty things, wow. and there again, there can be things that. It, that other people are mentioning or things that are just coming out in new research studies or uh, people's new understanding um, that add to the manifestations that we've identified in those 16 categories and over 50 subcategories. And, and, and like you say, Amanda, sorry for interrupting. I, I just want to make it clear since we're going out uh, uh, to the world that again, you don't, it's not, uh, a list where you have all of these, you know, this is a variable list. You have, you know, out of that 50, you don't need to get 
20 out of 50. You don't, it's not a diagnostics list. It really is a, a way of determining this profile. Is that right? Yes. And, but I want to stress that if you find something that's not on this, uh, these list of profile categories, um, it may also be a manifestation of CVI that we haven't been able to identify yet, but, but yeah. you have or somebody else has. Things are changing all the time. We kept on changing this list up until the time we finished, um, finished the document. And I probably could change it even more now. So it's fluid, it's organic, it's coming together, and we all have to stay on top of it. And the data for the profile can come from multiple sources. And we talked about having, um, you know, uh, multiple, multi multiple methods of assessment. And that could be from medical records, MRIs, um, doctor's reports, eye doctor's reports, interview and history taking, which is very, very important, formal and formal assessments, and observations in specified environments. And um, it really has to, the observations have to come from different environments because the children operate differently in different environments. I was just about to ask that. So, uh, so you, the word specified there um, doesn't mean so like in the lab or in my office or in your office. It means, you know, you, you have to take these observations in a whole range of different environments. I think so. And um, what's important about that is that if you have these different observations in different environments, it doesn't negate the observations, it deepens them. So that you know in planning the interventions that in different environments you have to make different types of interventions or accommodations. Great, great, great. So, so I'm pointing, Amanda. Sorry about that. I get excited, and 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 so, basically, we shouldn't be worried that if we take these observations, um, we get different uh, reports uh, that might um, contradict each other. That's completely okay. I think it's perfect. Um, if you have someone, the a uh, really simple example is that if you have a child in a doctor's office and they take a visual acuity measure, they're gonna have different results than if you do it for functional vision acuity measure out in the classroom because they're gonna have different lighting situations, the child may be more fearful in a doctor's office or less fearful. Um, they're not gonna have distractions in a doctor's office. They may use different charts, but um, if you get a lower or a higher visual acuity in a classroom, it changes the way you present material in the classroom. So one is for um, determining visual impairment and legal blindness or whatever that would be. Um, and then um, that would be each eye separately. And for a functional acuity, it could be different in the doctor's office than in the classroom, but you want to see where the child is operating. And in two different classrooms with different lighting, the acuity measures might be different. So, so it, go ahead. You, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, so, um, I, mean, I mean, this is great, but um, but it's the wrong word, but I'm going to use the word, but so uh, uh, time, Amanda, I, I, I need time, don't I? I need time to understand the child. It's, in order to get this, in order to determine a CVI profile, I'm, I, I'm going to have to take these observations, take mm -hmm. the history uh, again about the child in different environments, which the history should cover, but it, it's, it's time. And I shouldn't be afraid of that. Well, I mentioned this the other day when a talk that I was giving, and I'll mention it again. Once when I was an outreach teacher, 
um, a wonderful teacher of the visually impaired called me in to take a look at one of her children who have visual impairments and multiple disabilities. And she said to me, Amanda, sometimes it takes me two years to understand a child. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I think that I think that's right. And, and you know, it's that rushing. And I, I think there's an issue that maybe perhaps some of the TVIs and QTVIs, as we call them over here, uh, uh, are pressured, you know, pressured by their line managers to do, you know, all these interventions and see improvements and things like that. But actually what we need to do is, is take the time to understand the child because we can understand the child in depth, which is what I think this CVI profile is trying to do, then the interventions we can do will be more significant. And I understand for, for QTVIs, as you call them in the UK, and TVIs in the, in the US, that this is a luxury because many of them have lots of children on their caseload and they don't have this luxury but it's very important not to make hard and fast statements about these children that will mislabel them or misidentify them. And um, it's important to just say, well, this is it now, this is the situation, um, these are the interventions that I'm going to be trying now, and just keep working at it, keep it, keep you know, it's like chipping away, just chipping away at the issues until you get closer and closer. And the other thing to um, remember is that uh, assessment and intervention are, in, are quite tied together. And that's tied together in something that we've been calling diagnostic teaching. And that started with um, uh, reading, um, uh, a process in um, reading literature. And we've kind of adopted this for CBI because there's so few efficacy studies of intervention for CBI. So if you try an intervention with a child with CBI, you can look at that intervention as a hypothesis, apply the intervention, see if it works, if it doesn't work, see if it needs to be altered or changed completely, and then move on from there. Um, and each intervention is a little research study where you have um, a hypothesis, where you have an implementation of your little intervention program and if it works you move forward with it you add elements to it if it doesn't you change elements of it or you say why is this not working just like i had to ask with the children that i was working with where it wasn't working it's like ah why is it working with this child and not this child i gotta figure this out and 20 years later, I might still not have figured it out, but I'd love to go back to some of those children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Some different techniques and see if they work. What, um, what I'm thinking, because uh, for everyone, uh, 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 I, this is the first time I've seen this. And um, I think what I'm really uh, beginning to, because what I'm finding difficult, right, is um, differential diagnosis, you know, uh, is it CVI or is it something else, you know, and, and that's, and that's a hard skill, you know, and I chat to uh, our neuropediatricians here in Scotland, um, trying to absorb all of their knowledge, because I think anything that can help me get to differential diagnosis, because as you said earlier, you've got to apply the right interventions and understand the root cause so that the interventions will have the maximum impact. And, and, and I'm thinking maybe I can use this CVI profile to help me with that differential diagnosis. I don't know. Would that be, would that be right? Or am, I, or am I slightly off on a different track? Well, I think that um, this information can be given to the people who make that diagnosis 
whether it's a medical practitioner or a psychologist or a neuropsychologist, so that the children aren't misidentified as having autism or developmental coordination disorder or learning disabilities, or they might have um, a number of these things as part of their diagnosis. But it's, it's very important to combine this information so that people understand in understanding the application of the tests that they're given. So um, another important point is that any assessment that's done on a child with CVI, the items on the assessment might be influenced by the child's manifestations of CVI. So if you're looking at a developmental test and the, the item on the test is glances from one object to another, which is a common infant uh, developmental item, well, if the child has ocular motor problems, if they're not able to see the item, if they are, um, you know, have problems with um, eye, um, eye object coordination for various reasons, if the objects are too close together and they have simultaneous nausea and can't pick them apart, um, these things are going to affect the, the performance on the item. Um, looks at pictures in a picture book is another common item. Yeah. <laughs> well, what if they can't see the pictures in the picture book? Now, we know that for children with visual impairments, but it's also true for children with cerebral visual impairments, and it may not be the size of the pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. Oh, just brilliant. And, and, and it's just brilliant. So look, it said on one of your slides there that um, uh, it's in press. Do you know when the CVI profile is going to be uh, going to be published? Um, we're just finishing the last editing of it now, and um, this is going to be a marker in time. But because of the um, sheltering in place with the coronavirus, I don't know what's happening with the publication schedule of the publisher, American Printing House for the Blind. So um, it's very hard to predict when it's coming out. And that's why we're trying to get it out now in the, in the bits and pieces that we can. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Um, when it does get released, I'll go back to this video and I'll add in, the, uh, in all the publication information. Thank I'm you. Sure you can get that. Thank you. So Amanda, um, I know you've been busy. I know you're retired and <laughs> you're busier than ever, I think, uh, to be honest. You know, you scare me because when I retire, I just want to go to a beach and just, you know, drink martinis and things like that. But you're, you're working harder than ever. And trust me, I'm extremely grateful for that because I'm learning so much for you. And, and one of your, the other busy things is your companion guide. Okay, you've, you've done a lot of work around this companion guide. So, so do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Okay, well, let me sh uh, share my screen again. And I can just show you. Um, we have a cover for it. If I can, there it is. Ah. So it's the companion guide to um, something that um, we wrote a number of years ago, the developmental guidelines for infants with visual impairments, a guidebook for intervention. And these are the components of the companion guide. And um, the reason I, I want to mention the companion guide is that what we found in going through the research is that CVI affects all developmental domains. So just as it affects all the items that could be delivered on an assessment tool, um, just as it affects all the expanded core curriculum areas in children who are going to school. It affects development across the board. So in the companion guide, we have the manifestations of CBI in children. And that's what I shared with you with the categories in the yeah. CBI profile, the possible consequences. Oops, there's a typo there, sorry, of CBI in children. 
Oh, all right, yeah, I see. The next one are CBI narrative chapters and coordinated tips for practice. And this is the part where we researched um, the um, child development research in five developmental, four developmental domains, I think it's four, um, communication, social, emotional, cognition, um, fine motor, and gross motor. And we looked at interventions that address developmental needs and strengths. And what we found is um, so important um, I looked, my assignment was looking at fine motor, and I thought, okay, you know, I know some things about motor and gross motor, and I looked at the research, and it's really expanded in, in early childhood. And what I found is that they, they have developmental cascades where um, development in fine and gross motor cascades into other areas of development mm -hmm. so you're not just seeing problems in fine motor affecting just fine motor down the line or even at the same time it can affect communication socialization and cognition yep. and so it's really important when we think about holistic assessment to look at the whole child, not just vision. Children are children. They are not just vision. They are not just functional vision. They are not just vision processing. They are children and everything is intertwined in children. And so it demands a lot of understanding. Well, uh, absolutely, uh, and, and it really is to, I mean, I, uh, my PhD thesis looked at the role of, of actual hands and the, the relationship with language, so I totally get what you're saying here, uh, and it's really looking at those developmental domains there uh, and having that holistic overview, because why would you assume uh, that, um, you know, you're just looking at vision and vision, that's it, I mean, if, if I mean, we've got all sorts of numbers, 40%, 80%. Uh, uh, I can quote you all sorts of different references about how much the brain uses for vision. Of course, it's going to be intertwined with all these other developmental delays. And it's really good to see this really coming out now and clearly within this. Take, take me through a little bit more <laughs> since I've got you online. <laughs> <laughs> now, what we've added to the narrative chapters are um, tips for practice that summarize some of the intervention tips for children with CBI. But I want to remind everybody that um, any kind of behaviors that are noted, you have to go back to that root cause, the organic cause. And so that's why it's important to have the um, CBI profile to see how the CBI affects all the behaviors that you're looking at in the developmental domain. So we have a CBI profile form to collect the ongoing data and look at areas to target for interventions. Then we also have, um, based upon what we had in the original developmental guidelines, functional vision developmental progress logs where you can monitor early functional vision development milestones for children with CVI. And um, the whole point of the companion guide is to bring all this work to fruition in intervention planning and monitoring. So we have an intervention planning and monitor forms to design interventions and analyze their data on their effects over time. Wow. So it kind of brings together the things that um, the three of us have been thinking about um, for all children and then for children with CVI. So we'd like to get this out as soon as possible. The printing house has been very um, uh, proactive in helping us bring this out. Um, again, I, I, I'm not sure when it will come out. We were hoping this summer, but I, I honestly don't know the summer of, uh, because I better put a timestamp, the summer of 2020. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's go back to that. Um, uh, the picture of the image again. Then the the front cover, just so people of the companion guide. Oh, okay. There you go. There we go. Okay, so we need to look out for that again, folks. If uh, when it comes out, I'll put it up on the YouTube links and my university links, and I'll let everyone know. But um, uh, wow, that, that that's a huge piece of work. Yeah, it was a lot of work, um, but it was worth it um, because we want people to be able to work with all the children and understand them and know the most appropriate interventions for them. And if you can provide the interventions at early ages, um, that's the best way to do it. Absolutely, absolutely. Gosh, gosh, I'm, I, I'm too scared to ask the next question, Amanda, because I'm going to wrap it up fairly soon because uh, I've taken so much of your time. Uh, I've got really two questions. I'm going to ask the easy question uh, again and, and wholly unfairly because you're, you're, you're being recorded is, um, you know, I want to come back and record you again at a later date. Are you, are you okay for that? <laughs> I'm very okay with it. I love chatting with you, John. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, my other question is, uh, and I am a little bit scared to ask this, um, just because you are retired and, and, and you are insane. <laughs> and that is, what are you working on next? Um, <laughs> <laughs> just so I'll throw that one in. That's a very good question. And I'm glad that I have some time and space to think about it because I'm not sure. And um, I have this funny way of working on things where um, I have to wait until the spirit moves me. <laughs> and I feel like I have something to say before I start working on things. So, um, you know, this companion guide um, brought together a lot of my work over many years and was fortunate to have the support of Drs. Chen and Hartman. And um, so I can't tell you what I'm gonna work on next. Um, mentoring this, me, Amanda, you're gonna keep on mentoring me. That's what you're going to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> keep on answering my questions. <laughs> and you mentor me also, John. Well, you're very kind. Look, Amanda, I'm not gonna take up much of your time. It's been, as always, a real pleasure. It's been a real honor, and uh, I, I just can't um, get over how much work must have got into the CVI profile and the companion guide. So I'm looking forward to getting a copy of that, and uh, as soon as it's printed, send one over to me. All right? I'll, well, I'll, I'll buy one. I'll even buy one for you, Amanda, all right? I'll get you one. But once again, thank you so much, and um, I know we'll chat soon, but uh, on this initial one, Thank you so much, Amanda. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, John. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye.